Welcome back to Class Time, Cape Physics. I'm Paul Bender, and today we'll be looking into alternating currents. Let's begin. Uh, when we think about the word current, we think of some sort of flow. Also, when we look at alternating current, we think of some kind of switching. And so today, we, as we go through our lesson, we will come to understand what alternating currents are all about. And we look at some of the characteristics and what you call parameters of alternating currents. All right, so, and so this is our presentation for it. All right, at the end of this presentation, you should be able to do the following. You should be able to distinguish between AC means alternating current and DC means direct current. AC and the DC. Interpret graphs because we can, we can represent alternating currents. We can represent them um, graphically. And so we ought to be able to interpret the graphs of alternating currents. You're also supposed to be able, should be able to write down an equation for an AC for an alternating current because we can represent it also in equation form. If you can plot, if you can have graphs, we can have equations as well. And what explain what is called RMS current or voltage. RMS means root mean squared current <coughs> or voltage. This is a new term, and so we will spend a little time on it. Okay, so we we'll start with direct current. We, most of the currents that we use, like from batteries and those cells and so on, they are direct currents. And one feature of a direct current is that a direct current is a flow of charged particles. As a matter of fact, any electrical current is a flow of charged particles in whatever medium, whether it be in metals, whether it be in semiconductors, whether it be in, in, in electro, electrolytes or Wherever it is, it's a flow of charged particles. And a direct current is a flow of charged particles in a fixed direction due it, it, to an electric field which is also in a fixed direction. So here, here we have an electric field coming down and these are the charged particles flowing. So these charged particles constitute an electric current. Okay, and that's a direct current because the charged particles are flowing in one direction. All right. In contrast, an alternating current, or um, use AC, is a flow of charged particles that change direction periodically due to an electric field which also changes direction periodically. So as the electric field changes direction, the charged particles also change direction. So an alternating current, the, the charged particles change direction. And so we'll demonstrate this. So we have the alternating current, the charged particles, as the field changes direction, the charged particles go up. The fields change directions to up, the charged particles go down, and so on, right? And so as the field, electric field changes direction, the alternating, the, the charged particle move a, and if you notice, and, and we can recall from the last class that we did, how, um, I'll just go back a little bit, um, just to, all right, so here we notice that the field is down, but the charges are negative and the charges are moving opposite to the field. And try to remember from the last lesson that we did, we looked at forces of electric fields on charged particles. And we said that the negative charge will move in opposite direction to the electric field, all right? And so this is consistent with what we have done before, all right? So we looked at our alternating current. Now an AC current can be re represented by what is called a rotating phasor. Now, what a phasor is, it's a straight line having a definite direction and length because um, we have various models to represent 
these, these phenomena that take place. All right, and so we use a rotating phaser in order to represent an alternating current. So as the, the objects, the charged particles change direction, they kind of, they, they produce what is called an oscillatory motion. They, they move between two fixed positions. In a direct current, all the charged particles become, begin to drift through the conductor. But with an alternating current, as the electric field changes direction, the charged particles drift, and then they drift in the opposite direction. And so they perform oscillatory motion. And um, if you can recall in your mechanics, you would have done oscillatory motion in which a, a body moves between two fixed positions. And you can represent this motion in with a circular, with circular motion, because the projection of circular motion, it's projected onto oscillatory motion. And so a phaser is that type of oscillatory motion. And so we, let's look and see what we have here. So as the particles move, the phaser begins to go around. The phaser is going around in an anti-clockwise motion, up and down, and then up and then down. As it goes, the particles, the phaser begins to, to go around. And so the phaser is now what we are going to use to represent this alternating current. Or we'll represent the alternating current by the phaser. And we'll see how using this phaser, we'll be able to come up with an equation for an alternating current. Okay, and so, so right now we are at the point where we're saying that an alternating current is a current which changes direction periodically because of a changing electric field. Whenever you switch on a light or whenever you switch on a device in the conductor, an electric field immediately appears and that electric field causes the charged particles in that conductor to begin to move. Okay, and so that's an, in, in an alternating current, we have an alternating voltage which produces an alternating electric field which causes the charged particles to move in alternating directions. All right, and so we move on. So the phaser, the phaser rotates through, at an ang through an angle theta equal to omega t in a time t from position 1 to position 2, where omega is the angular frequency of rotation. Do you remember from when you had in your mechanics, we said that the angular velocity is equal to the displacement, angular displacement divided by time. And so we can say that the angular displacement is the angular velocity times time, okay? Well, in our phase, as the phaser goes around, the phase is describing an angle, and the phaser moves from position A to position B, and it goes through an angle omega t, okay? It goes to an angle omega t. And this should look very familiar to you because you would have done it in mechanics. But we use slightly different termination terminologies. In mechanics, we said that this would be the angular velocity. If you notice, we use here angular frequency. And so it's the same thing. This angle here, theta, it moves to an angle theta, and that will be omega t. And omega, like in mechanics, is equal to 2 pi divided by the period of the rotation of the phaser. So if an object is going around in a circular path, then the, the period would be 2 pi divided by, the period would be t, and the angular velocity would be 2 pi divided by the period. Here we use angular frequencies, 2 pi divided by the period of rotation of the phaser. Okay? All right. And so we have this, we have this diagram here. So 
I naught, I naught is the radius of the circle, which the phase is going around. The phase it describes, and it's the peak value. I naught corresponds to the peak value of the current. And I is the magnitude of the current at any time t. And so this dimension here represents the current. This dimension here represents the peak value of the current. And so if we look at this diagram, there is a triangle formed. All right? There is a, there is a triangle formed. There is a triangle formed here. Right? And this triangle is a right angle triangle because I is perpendicular to this horizontal here. This would be the hypotenuse and this would be the side opposite. And so if we use trigonometry with that triangle, we'll see that we have that from the trigonometry that sine times omega t, sine of omega t, which is the angle, is equal to the side opposite over the hypotenuse, I over I naught. If we redistribute, we will see that we have that I is equal to I naught. I have A here, but this ought to be I naught. That's that. I is equal to I naught sine omega t. That represents an equation for, right? This equation represents the magnitude of an alternating current at time t. That's what it represents, the magnitude of an alternating current at time t. So this triangle here represents the, at any time, t. So we have an equation. I is equal to I naught sine omega t. And in order for an alternating current to be produced, there must be an alternating voltage. We can't have a current unless we have an EMF or a voltage to drive the current. You must have a potential difference in order for any current to, to take place. So, for instance, a water current flowing down. Water current comes from a high potential, gravitational potential, to a lower gravitational potential. If there is no difference in height, then the water doesn't flow. And in any kind of flow, wind, the flow of wind, high pressure area to a low pressure area, high elastic potential to low elastic potential. And so in the same way, we have, you must have an alternating voltage in order to drive an alternating current. And so an alternating voltage has the same characteristic as an alternating current. And so if we want to have an equation for what an alternating voltage would be, it would be V is equal to V naught sine omega T. And we'll see how we would use these alternating currents and alternating voltages. Okay. Let's consider the, ver the, the phase at various positions in its rotation. The magnitude of the current is projected onto a current time axis at equal time intervals. All right, so we have current time axis at equal time intervals. And so let's see what happens here. So we have at this time interval, at this, we are projecting where it is at these points here. So we're projecting. At this point, we're projecting it here. At this point, we're projecting it, this one here, and this one here. So what we have seen, we have projected those points at equal time intervals on these axes. All right? And so what we see has happened is that with these projections of all of these at these positions here, when we graph, when we graph it, if we draw a line through the points, we will see the line through the points is a sinusoidal curve. And that is not surprising because our, our equation tells us it's a sine relationship. Our equation says it's I is equal to I naught sine omega t. So we expect a sinusoidal relationship. And so here we see when we're using the phasor, the phasor, represents the current and the phaser when projected onto axes, the movement of the phaser when projected onto axes represents a graphical representation of the current. Okay, and so here this this 
outcome corroborates what we get for our equation. All right? And so here now, we are at the point where we, where we see we can represent an alternating current by an equation, and we can also represent an alternating current graphically. So what we will look to see now, if they must be related, because we can't get a graph unless we have an equation. If we have a graph, we have some form of equation that will represent the graph, or at, at least be able to model what it is is on the graph. Okay, and so let's see the relationship between the equation that we got for the alternating current and this graphical re sinusoidal relationship here. Okay. So here is an AC graph. This this is what you would find on a, an oscilloscope. Um, so this is an AC graph. And so we will look at some parameters. Or those are some quantities that are related to an alternating current that we can determine from a graph. Okay? And so the first one, on the current or the current or voltage time graph, this can either be a current time or a voltage time graph. Because you remember we said that they have the same characteristic. If they are plotted on the same axis, they wouldn't have the same height because you remember that voltage is equal to current times resistance or current is equal to voltage time resistance. And so the voltage might be higher than the current, okay? All right, so here, I0 represents the peak current from the middle line, from the x-axis up to the peak of any part of the thing. I0 is from here to here as well. Okay, that represents the peak current. And we have T, and we have two me means of measuring T. T is the period. T is the time it takes for this alternating current to make one complete cycle, or the time it takes for the phaser to make one complete rotation, or the time it takes for a charged particle in the conductor to make one complete oscillation. They're all the same, okay? So it's the time it takes for this, this graph for one complete um, cycle, time it takes for the phaser to make one complete rotation, or the time it takes for a charged particle in the current to make one complete oscillation, all the same. So T is the period, and it will be from, uh, from alternate, from alternate um, zero points on the graph or between two consecutive peaks, okay? And either of them will give you what the, the um, period is, okay? And so those are two quantities that are parameters of the alternating current. So we can speak of peak current, we can speak of period. And if we go back, again, if we go back to your mechanics, you know that frequency and period are related, and that is also from oscillate oscillations. The frequency is the reciprocal of the period, so frequency is equal to one over period and vice versa. Period is equal to one over frequency, the inverse of frequency, okay? So here we have period is equal to one over frequency, okay? So you might, the question might arise, what is frequency? So the frequency is the number of complete oscillations that are, that are made in unit time, which is one second. How many, how much ever oscillations are made in one second? That's the frequency. The period is the time it takes for one oscillation. Okay? All right. Now we're going to look at what is called the root mean square current. All right? The root mean square current. Um, when you want to represent Oftentimes, statistically and otherwise, when you want to represent something about a group of person, 
you talk about you, the average height or the average weight of something. Average. And the average gives you an estimate. It doesn't say everything about the individuals in that group, but it says something about if somebody, if you say, well, the average height of a, of a basketball team is six foot seven inches, you know is that really a lot of tall people, right? And if you say the average height of the football team is five foot eight inches, you know those are average height people. Okay, you can say something about the, 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 the quantity or whatever it is by taking an average. And so we, the root means square. But if you try to take the average of an alternating current, it will average out to zero. Let me, see, let me show you. Reason being. All right, I'll go back a little bit. Reason being. All here is positive. And all here is negative. So if I average out this positive and negative, they are identical, but one is positive. When you add them, you get zero. And if a positive, negative, positive, and if you keep going on, you get positive and negative. If you keep adding them, you will get zero. So to take just an average, it will be futile. Because you will always, the average of an alternating current will always be zero. So what, what, what is done, you take what is called the root mean square. And the root mean square means it's the mean of the squares of the current. It is different from the square of the mean. It's the mean of the squares of the currents. And let's see how that is done. The RMS current is used to represent the average current or voltage in an AC system. All right? And RS, RMS means the root mean square and is the mean of the squares of the currents over a current or voltage cycle. So you take a cycle and you, and you average all the currents over that cycle. So here is an example. Consider the intervals, intervals taken on a current or voltage time graph. So we take at when the when the the um, current the, the quantity is seven units, ten units, seven units, and we go right across a whole cycle. Okay. So we just took the, took those intervals, and you take it at equal time intervals. All right. So we took those. So if we now go and the table below can be made, right? The values, we took 7, 10, 7, 0, negative 7, negative 10, negative 7, and 0. All right? We can square all of those. 49, 100, 49, 0, 49, 10, 100, 49, 0. We know when we square a negative quantity, we get a positive. So we took the values, we found the squares. Now we're going to find the mean of the squares. We're going to find the mean or the average of the squares. So the sum, first of all, you find the sum of the squares, that's 396. And then you find the mean of the squares, you divide the sum by the amount, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And when you divide 396 by 8, you get 49.5. That is the mean of the squares. But you want the root of the mean of the squares. So you'll take the square root of the mean of the squares. And so when we take the square root, you get 7.04. Okay, you get 7.04. So let's go further, and we'll see that the peak value divided by the RMS value, if we divide, do that, we will get 10 divided by 7.04. Remember the peak value, if I go back just quickly? The peak value here was 10 at the peak there. 10 or negative 10, but it's 10 units tall. That's the peak value, okay, 10. So we'll di divide the peak value by the RMS value, and you get 1.42, which is approximately root 2. Now, what would happen if we had taken more? We took um, 0, negative 7, 10. 7, 10, 7, 0. If we had taken 
zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and, and go right and take the, the values very close. This value here, 1.42 is quite close to, to root 2. Because if we round it off to one decimal position, root 2 is 1.41. And 1.42, if we round them off to the first decimal position, we'll get 1.4. But if we take more points over the cycle, it becomes closer and closer to root 2. Okay, this is just a, a, a quick example. And then, so... If more intervals are used, then it can be shown that I0 over root 2 is equal to IRMS. The RMS value is equal to the peak value divided by root 2. RMS value is equal to the peak value. So we can represent this current. As a matter of fact, when you talk about your outlet, and we'll see a problem with it, your outlet is 110 volts. That 110 volts is the RMS value you're being told. They tell you the RMS value. They don't tell you the peak value. They tell you the RMS value. So we have fifth cycle, 110 volts. So that 110 volts they're saying it's, that is told is the RMS value. That is what is used now to represent either the current or the voltage. Okay, the RMS value. Have root mean square. All right. So the RMS value represents the direct current that dissipates the same power in a resistor. It is often called the equivalent DC. So RMS value is whatever the equivalent DC would dissipate, power in a, in a resistor. How much ever power and equivalent, this equivalent DC will will. How much of a power the alternating current dis dissipates, the RMS value says that this DC current here would dissipate the same amount of energy in a resistor. And we call it the DC equivalent. Okay. Unless otherwise stated, the values quoted for the magnitude of AC currents or voltages are the RMS values. If they're going to say, if, and in any event, where the, if they're going to use any other thing, any other quantity with regards to an AC current or the magnitude of an AC current, because you can have the peak voltage or current, you can have the peak-to-peak -peak voltage or current, it will be clearly stated. But if you just say an alternating current of so, 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 it means it's an RMS. If they want to say, they will say the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of an AC current and so. All right? So, let's look at some sample questions. So here we have an AC voltage graph. All right? And so for the AC voltage trace, you want to find first the peak that ought to be um, V0. The V0, um, this is my error in preparing this. This ought to be V0, VRMS, T, and the equation. All right? There is big voltage here, and I have I0. <laughs> I get zero for that one there. All right. These ought to be, these ought to be V0. This is V0, VRMS, and then we look at the equation. All right? So V0 will be the peak voltage, which is any, any one of these peaks here would represent V0, okay? And so here, V0, uh, this is 5, 6, 7, 8, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, wow, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, it's about, um, again, this is about 6 volts, a little bit above 6 volts, because this is each one of these is 1.25. That's about 6.25 volts, all right? Let's round it off to 6 volts there, okay? And then IRMS, all right? The RMS value would be the peak value divided by root 2. And since we're using 6, it will be 6 divided by root 2, which is about 4.2 volts, all right? IRR, VRMS would be 6 divided by root 2, 
which is 4.2 volts. And then we have T, right? T would be between from zero to alternate zero. And this one is at 20 milliseconds. This one is at 40 milliseconds. So it will be 40 minus 20. That would be 20 milliseconds, all right? And so in order to determine the equation now, we know the equation is of the form, we you know the equation is of the form 6 sine 100 pi, o, pi t. All right, so we have, we have t is equal to 20 milliseconds, and that would be 20 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. F is equal 1 over t, and that would be equal to 1 over 20 times 10 to the negative 3, all right? And the, so the equation would become V is equal to 6 sine, and remember it's omega, omega, which is 2 pi over 20 by 10 to the negative 3, and you, that will work out to be 100 t, pi, pi t. Okay? So that's how we end up with that there. So it will be 6 sine 100 pi t. Okay? That would be in, in volts. Okay? All right. All right. So it says find the voltage at t equal 11.5 milliseconds. Now I want to emphasize what I have written here. Whenever you're using this equation, you must, you must use the angles, the sine and the cosine or whatever you use, it must use the radian measure. Because omega is, a, is measured in radian. So omega t is a radian measure. So you'll have to move your calculator from the degree mode to the radian mode. If you use your calculator in the degree mode to, to calculate the sine of any angle or the sine of anything in this particular case here, you will get the incorrect answer. You must move your calculator to radian mode because the omega t is in radians. You must be put in radian mode to find the sign. Okay, and so we'll just substitute in order to find that. We'll find that v is 6 sine 100 pi times, um, remember 11.5 milliseconds is 11.5 over 1,000, which is 0 0.0115. And so that will give... Um, 6, and when you find um, sine of 1, um, you'll get sine of this, 100 pi, ooh, all right, let me just take off a piece here, we'll get sine of, you'll get 6 sine of 100 pi, that would be 1.15 times 3.142, all right? So when you multiply 1.15 by 3.142, you'll find the sign of that. And remember again, very important, extremely important, that you put your, cal your calculator in the radian mode. For this and when you work that out you'll get 0 0.4 and you'll get the current or the voltage being 2.7 volts okay so let's go on to another the same sample question continued it said draw the equivalent dc of the alternating voltage so what they're asking us is to draw a line to represent the rms remember dc doesn't change direction, so a DC would be a straight line across, and it will have the same magnitude as the RMS voltage. Okay, and the RMS voltage is 4.2 volts, 
And so when we draw our line, this here would represent the DC equivalent of this alternating voltage, okay? The DC equivalent is the same as the RMS voltage, okay? It says another sample question. Domestic electrical outlets in Jamaica are rated at 110 volts with a frequency of 50 hertz. Write down the equation for a domestic outlet. So, we know that the VRMS, remember when we said, we said 110 volts, it means VRMS. VRMS of 110 volts. And so V0, the peak voltage would be VRMS times 0.2 because you remember um, VRMS is V0 over root 2. We cross multiply, we'll get that, and we get that the V0 is 155.6 volts. And so we, omega is 2 pi divided by the, by the period or 2 pi times frequency. And it says the frequency is 50 hertz. We have 50 cycles. And then, so we multiply the 2 pi by 50 and we get 100 pi, okay? And so the equation would be V equal 155.6 sine 100 pi T. That would be an equation for the electrical out, of the out, output of an electrical outlet here in Jamaica. Okay. So let's, let's go back. We said that alternating current is a current that changes direction periodically because of an alternating electric field. And that electric field will be set up by some potential difference existing across. And then we, it, that is in difference to an alternate, a direct current in which the, the current flows in one direction. And because of, the, of its periodicity, we can set up a phaser which represents the alternating current because the alternating current moves periodically and so we set up a phaser. And we can use that phaser in order to determine, to write an equation for the alternating current. And using that equation, we can find many parameters with regards to an alternating current. We, and also, we can use it to calculate quantities that are related to an alternating current. We also saw that we can use the graph to find some parameters for the alternating current. And we introduced a new term called the RMS value of the alternating current or voltage, and this is what we said is the direct current equivalent of an alternating current, and it is equal to the peak voltage or current divided by the square root of two. Now, one important thing I must mention again, that when we are using the equation for an alternating current, we must always use our calculator in the radian mode. 